So I'm going to welcome Dr. Mark Luciano here tonight. Uh, and I usually have the speaker um, introduce themselves a little bit and talk about why they're interested in Chiari and related disorders. So I think I'm going to start with that. And then I know you have some slides that you're going to present as well, I believe, right? So I'll give you the presenter mode as well. But if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, I'm Mark Luciano. I'm a neurosurgeon. I worked for many years in Cleveland, but uh, for the last five years, I've been working here in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins University. Here, I, uh, I head the CSF Disorders Group, and CSF Disorders includes things you sure may have heard of, hydrocephalus and things like pseudotumor cerebri, and I'll, I'll talk about some of these fluid disorders. And I also was very interested for many years in, of course, Chiari malformation. And I really do consider uh, Chiari malformation as, as one of the uh, disorders of, of, of the fluid in the brain as well. And it's very much influenced of, by the fluid in the brain. Hydrocephalus and other forms of problems affect Chiari. And uh, that's really the, the, the point I wanna make and illustrate and, and talk about for the most part uh, in this session, but I'm also of course open to other topics. But uh, for many years we've, we've uh, done Chiari decompressions for me, first in children, and also now uh, a lot in adults. And it's impressed me over time uh, how our thinking about Chiari has, in a sense, changed, or at least my thinking. Uh, and uh, a lot of it has to do with all the exposure that I've gotten in fluid disorders in the brain. And uh, we are currently doing a study looking at, at uh, the pulsation of the brain, how it's deformed in its shape, and um, how it's affected by the surgical procedures we do. I've also done studies uh, in collaboration with, with uh, psychologists and, and scientists in, in the Cleveland area uh, about the, the psychology of Chiari, mainly how Chiari might affect, uh, uh, well, personality, emotions, and cognition. And a lot of that is really just, just starting and, and becoming, becoming very interesting. So I've been interested in research uh, and years of clinical work in children and adults. Awesome, thank you. That was pretty succinct considering. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm gonna give you presenter abilities. Let me know if you get that. I will share. Perfect. Then if I can, I'll go yeah. ahead. Okay, can, can people see these slides? Yes. And I don't want to overemphasize these slides. I'll go quickly through them. And they're mainly to show you a few dynamic pictures uh, and to kind of illustrate the journey I was talking about from, from when, I, when I was a, doing a lot of pediatric cases and considering Chiari malformation, a malformation, that is a, a, a alteration in the shape of the skull uh, and squeezing of the brain in the back, uh, to thinking of it later on in, in much more complicated ways. In, in the context of the fluid dynamics in, that are in that skull. Uh, just to, to say we have a Chiari group here with neurosurgeons treating kids and adults. And I, I, I wanna say we may touch upon some of the things that, that uh, uh, work that we've done and ideas that I've shared with a lot of people throughout the country, but I'd like to especially call out to people in, uh, in Ohio uh, that I mentioned uh, doing research with, uh, engineers, uh, Conquer Chiari and Bobby Jones, uh, Chiari and Seringo Malia Foundation, of course, you're here. And as I mentioned, uh, my current grant uh, is with uh, dynamic motion and Chiari malformation. So this is kind of classic Chiari malformation slide. First of all, it calls it a malformation, implying that there's an abnormality in shape, perhaps in the skull. I used to think of Chiari quite simply as, well, maybe a brain or in cerebellum a little bit too big for that area back in the brain, what's called a posterior fossa. And the squeezing that occurs, and I'm sure everyone online is very familiar with this because you're here, but the squeezing here at the cervical medullary junction, the junction between the head and the neck. And here you see that famous uh, measurement of the descent of the tonsils. Here's the bottom of the, the, the skull, the, the great hole, the foramen magnum, and the tonsils going all the way down to here. That's uh, probably about two centimeters or so down below. And uh, that's certainly considered uh, a descent of the tonsils when you hear that term. Moreover, you can see that there's not much room here. There's not much room for fluid and the shape of these areas seem like they're squeezed. Well, this seems to make sense that this is not good and this may cause symptoms, may cause pressure and pain. 
It also was believed that it, it compression also blocks up the uh, flow chain flow areas and passages in the spinal cord and can cause a syrinx. And I'm being very simplistic in, in the pathology here, but, but this is the general thinking was the blockage up here caused fluid accumulation uh, in the spinal cord. And of course you have the headache, the neck pains, cranial nerve dysfunction, cranial nerves and nerves that come off all around this area that control the face swallowing uh, and, uh, and it can also of course affect hearing uh, and balance as well. So these cranial nerves of course can be affected because they're squeezed. And then of course spinal cord dysfunction, of course, spinal cord controls the arms and the legs and you have that fluid going all the way down the spinal cord. So this kind of makes a, a, a neat, compact, uh, consistent idea of what Chiari malformation uh, is like. But, you know, a, a neurosurgeon's simplistic view of anatomy causing the squeezing in the skull, which then causes symptoms, uh, it is, is not always that simple, I wish it was. And uh, of course, the anatomy is affected in different ways by perhaps genetics, and this is being looked at in several, several centers around the country and world. And also effects of environment. By, by environment, I mean what happens to the, to the brain and, and, and uh, the structures uh, during a person's lifetime that causes the anatomy to get squeezed and symptoms to evolve. So this, this is a pretty simplistic way of looking at it. And we know it's simplistic because, well, like look at these two pictures. Uh, I picked these pictures because the tonsils come down about the same amount, uh, something like nine, 10, 10 millimeters, about a centimeter or more. Uh, but I picked them also because they're different in other ways. They're different in the way the fluid spaces look, bigger or smaller. They're different in the searings down below. And also, quite honestly, uh, you can't see this in the picture, but they differ. Uh, they're different in symptoms. Uh, only one of the patients is symptomatic at all. And it may not be the, the patient that you imagine is symptomatic. And so it brings up the question, what are we missing here? Well, when we talk just about the tonsils being down a certain amount, it certainly, we know, can't predict uh, if a person has symptoms. And so must not really necessarily be the fundamental part of what, what is going on in Chiari and what makes a person sy symptomatic. And if we don't know that, then we don't really know exactly who we should treat and how we should treat. It was always a, uh, a sad thing when we do a Chiari decompression and we find the person still has the symptoms. Why did it fail? And it can fail, we all know it can fail. It can make a person actually sometimes get worse with the Chiari symptoms. So there's obviously a lot to know and it goes beyond tonsillar descent. So what are we missing? Well, you know, obviously cerebellar descent is much too simplistic, you know? So we bring in other things, like I mentioned compression uh, of, of the, uh, of the spinal cord, compression of the cerebellum, loss of those fluid spaces. So we still can look at that static sagittal view of the brain that you saw and look at more than just uh, tonsillar descent. We can evaluate some of the fluid spaces that go up and down. And indeed, in one of projects several years ago, we looked at uh, how, how can we uh, get the actual volume of the fluid spaces, not just one little measurement, and how can we assess how much resistance there is uh, uh, to fluid flow and, and does that make a difference in symptoms? So one thing that, that I think we miss is all the dynamics that, that go on in the brain and with the fluid. We're looking at static images. And one thing that's of course come up is we're looking at static images in a horizontal neutral position. And many of you have heard of you know, sitting upright uh, MRIs and uh, thinking that maybe things will shift in a way that, uh, that demonstrates more problems, more compression, or more descent of the tonsils than when a person is laying down. And, you know, I'm, I have to be honest, I don't think that much, that has shed much light, at least in my practice, uh, finding patients that have revealed Chiari compressions and so forth when they're up versus they're down. But these are the kinds of things we're looking at and want to look at. One reason I think is that the brain has almost the same density, not quite, but almost the same density uh, as, uh, as the fluid around it. So it, it kind of doesn't just drop down when you stand up. But in any case, these are kind of the things that we reach out for to look for why does this person have symptoms and, and this person not? Am I missing a Chiari here uh, in this static picture? The effect, effect of head position, if something looks open, but then when you move the head flexion or down, somehow closes up those spaces. 
uh, that's a key key concept that many people has led many people to do flexion extension films, which I think uh, in my practice and in many other people's uh, has in some cases revealed uh, people who are tighter that you would say, well, I don't think that person has much much tightness there or much, much compression <clears throat> to go along with their tonsil descent. So that's something which is again reaching out, and it also speaks to not only compression of the brain but the effect of those fluid spaces around. And I can, I'll keep coming back to fluid spaces uh, because we're gonna be talking a little bit about hydrocephalus and fluid problem. Also, you can, you can fail in treating someone's Chiari, even if you do a very nice decompression, if the cause of the, sep the symptoms is something else. I mean, that's, that's obvious. Uh, and in the past, historically, people have also looked at tethered cord. We know that tethered cord can be associated with Chiari. Uh, as sometimes, but what we are really uncertain about is how much is it ever really the etiology, the cause of, of downward tonsils, or how much does it really cause symptoms? And these are really uncertainties. So we're, people are searching uh, for the relationship between tethered cord, which is the spinal cord being pulled down in the spinal canal, held down at the bottom uh, near, near the sacrum down below. Uh, we can look at identical pictures of compression and one person has symptoms and the other one doesn't. Uh, is it because there was a bruise or injury or inflammation in one that we're not detecting the others? And there's many people studying uh, CSF, for example, looking for inflammatory markers that might, might say, this person is having a problem, this person being, has the inflammation. And again, what I'm focusing on a little bit here is the, is the fluid. Uh, changes in fluid pressure up in the head or the flow of fluid or the, the fluid pressure in the spinal canal. Also, I should mention that every time your heart beats and your brain throbs and grows, it pushes fluid down your spinal canal through that very small junction between your head and your neck, the cervical medullary junction. And that junction, of course, is much smaller when those spaces are blocked up uh, with, with the tonsils and things are crowded. So every time your heart beats, fluid's going up and down, up and down, up and down. And that dynamic interaction between the head and the spinal cord can be disrupted uh, by, by a Chiari uh, malformation or Chiari anomaly. This is, a, this is a early picture that I looked at. And I, when I look at this picture, I think of how I would deal with questions from the family about, they say, well, you know, will, will this go away? Or, what, what, you know, why is this here? And I would say, no, this Chiari, as you can see, uh, again, it's probably over a centimeter, maybe a centimeter and a half down. It go, goes way down here. It's wedge-shaped. It's pretty tight. And I would say, no, that, that's a, an anomaly that, that is going to be squeezed, and the brain is squeezing down on it. And the, the way to solve that is to take away, do, as you all know, a Chiari decompression. Well, in actuality, this one and, and other, others that I've seen look just like a... Uh, a malformation, if you will, of the posterior part of your head, which is squeezing down on that cerebellum tight. But what this is, is an acquired hydrocephalus. This is acquired uh, after a, someone was being treated for hydrocephalus with a drain uh, in their lumbar spine. It's called the lumbar drain. It was actually a lumbar shunt. And it caused low pressures down below. And with the differential pressure, the tonsils were actually sucked in over time and pulled downward. This is actually reversible. I'll show you some examples. This is actually reversible if you stop that pulling from below. And this is very important because we do it sometimes intentionally, like that shunt I mentioned. But it also happens for various causes, these fluid dynamic changes, uh, unintentionally or in, in processes of disease. So fluid dynamics can create a Chiari that is really constriction be between these bony elements. This is the bony part, bottom part of the skull. But the problem is really not the bones. It's the CSF dynamics. So what are CSF dis disorders? Well, I, many people have heard of hydrocephalus, accumulation of fluid in the head, build up, you make a pint a day. It, it, it's made inside the brain, flows outside the brain and around, and then flows down the spinal cord as well, and is absorbed in various places in the spinal cord and brain. If that flow is blocked anywhere, or if the absorption is blocked, the fluid builds up, and those fluid spaces inside the head called ventricles swell up and get bigger. That's hydrocephalus in kids and adults. That fluid is circulating around, uh, and there are some narrow passageways uh, called aqueducts, 
and other areas where it can get blocked and, and, and trap areas of fluid, create cysts, and create parts of the brain which swell up. There's also uh, types of CSF disorders where the pressure of the fluid is high, but it's not building up in one area, it's just high everywhere. And that's intracranial hypertension. And that's when the veins of the brain are blocked. The pressure in the veins goes up, and then the fluid pressure goes up because the fluid usually gets absorbed into the veins and it can't with that high pressure. So that's another CSF disorder that we often treat with shunting. Another one important and based on an earlier slide, I think you'd understand the intracranial hypotension or CSF leak. If you have low pressure in, in the head, then the brain can sag down and it can crowd down into uh, the neck area and cause a blockage. And this is one of the main things that we're concerned about when we see uh, Chiari malformation, is it acquired, is it caused by a differential pressure, either from above or below in fluid pressure? Is there, a, a, I had the example of the shunt from down below that obviously caused low pressure, but you can have a leak in your spinal canal, a leak that is really in many other ways undetected and can, can manifest as the sucking down of those tonsils. And when they do suck down in that way, uh, you can have all the symptoms and the anatomy of a Chiari malformation. So all of these things can be related to a Chiari malformation. They can make them worse and they can be utilized in ways of treating uh, that obstruction uh, at the base of the skull. And so Chiari and cerebrobiliary are indeed uh, to a great extent associated with and Chiari and uh, CSF uh, disorders. Well, what causes the crowding in the symptoms? And I, I, mentioned some of these causes. So of course, if the, if the back of the head is small, and there's been studies that show overall, there, there is a statistically smaller posterior, posterior fossa, and there's many measurements that have been done posteriorly at, at various angles and looking at volumes as well, to try and define what, what makes that smaller area back there. If it is small, uh, and it is in many forms of Chiari, uh, then that cerebellum when it grows up is just tight in there. And so it's a direct compression issue, all right? Uh, also, uh, as I mentioned, motion of the skull, if the spine, or the spine, I should say, could cause uh, uh, a compression at certain angles. That's more direct compressions. Or, and this gets more to the fluid dynamics, in that the brain can be pushed backwards. Of course, it could be, unfortunately, something like a solid mass or brain tumor, but it also can be pushed back by hydrocephalus, or fluid collections and cysts, or by the pulsation of fluid with every heartbeat uh, that, that I mentioned. And another way for Chiari to be created, in a sense, uh, or, or the cause of that crowding, is a, a spinal fluid leak. And, and I mentioned earlier that, that uh, there was another consideration of tethered cord. Uh, and I put a question mark there, because I really wonder if that is an etiology. I do uh, believe that in many cases, uh, that spinal fluid leaks or shunting uh, are, if not the etiology of a Chiari, and many times it's not the etiology, can at least influence the Chiari and can exacerbate it and make it worse. And we do have to watch out for them. So crowding in the posterior fossa can be caused by squeezing right there or pushing down into, into the neck and causing the tightness or by, in a sense, sucking down or pulling down. Now, once you have that crowded posterior fossa, and I won't get into this because it's not really part of this fluid dynamics, but you know, we really don't understand exactly what causes the symptoms. Is it just the compression of the brain? The brain feels no pain. Or is it the coating coverings around the brain, the meninges and the nerves that innervate them, which seems like a, a, a good possibility? Is it due to inflammation uh, of those nerves? Or as some suspect also that the blockage of that CSF movement, remember I said normally it goes up and down and it normalizes the pressure between your head and your spinal canal. If that's blocked, does that cause symptoms like headache or other dysfunctions of the brain? Finally, other symptoms, you know, uh, hyperflexion and movement of the head, uh, the association of these other things, syrinx, hydrocephalus, syrinx, all these things have their own sets of symptoms that can all also overlap and add to the way a person uh, presents with Chiari malformation. So here's a few examples. Hydrocephalus building up. These are the fluid spaces, the ventricles of the brain. And this is, you'll have to take my word for this, about two, three times the normal size. This, for, this ventricle back here is called the 
fourth ventricle. And this is probably three, four times the normal size. And this all contributes to push this part of the brain, the cerebellum and the tonsils downward. And here you see a Chiari malformation. Now, if I see this and the patient, even if the patient has symptoms of Chiari malformation, I could see that there's some blockage of fluid up here. And it would be actually not a good idea to do a decompression here. Why? Because it's not the, the primary cause of the Chiari. And because if you decompress when there's pressure up here, then there's a possibility that things just push on down farther uh, and, and recompress farther down, making things, if anything, worse. So one of the lessons here, when you have a hydrocephalus, and this is an obvious one, they're not always this obvious, that you should treat the cause, the dynamic cause, the fluid problem first, and, and not necessarily do a Chiari uh, decompression in this sort of situation. Here's another kind of situation. This is the spinal cord coming down. You can see the top of the syrinx, the syrinx being the fluid in the spinal cord. You can see the tonsils coming down to, to well below the foramen magnum. And here, the cerebellum is not big. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a big space, a fluid area. And there's fluid cysts back here, which can play a role in pushing the tonsil down. Again, if you're going to do anything back here, it should include decompressing or draining any CSF collections. Uh, or fluid collections, which are contributing to pushing down. Again, it's not the, the bone as much as it is the fluid that, that's pushing that brain down into the junction. This is a child uh, who had very difficult to, uh, to control hydrocephalus. That when he had a problem with that fluid building up in these ventricles, he would end up in the intensive care unit with a heart that slowed down uh, and, uh, and acute uh, mental status changes. He would become lethargic and sleepy. Well, many shunts didn't work in him, and someone put in a shunt in the spinal canal. This is a similar case of the adult I showed earlier. And you see here, there's no Chiari malformation. There's no bony problem here. There's no compression whatsoever. But this is the way we saw him, and we were consulted, not only for the hydrocephalus, but they said, oh, there's a Chiari malformation. Well, there was. And you can see here that the, the area down here is quite tight, and the tonsils are farther down. And it, it occurs that maybe, hey, the Chiari uh, itself is causing symptoms. We should decompress the Chiari. Again, that's not a good idea. It's not a good idea because this problem is due to a fluid dynamic problem with fluid being drained from below. By the way, I see a fair number of patients that have Chiari and have hydrocephalus. And it's a very tricky business uh, to treat because if you drain too much, if you drain too little and the fluid builds up up here, it pushes down this area that's already tight. And these patients can have crises of brain compression uh, and have collapses, have bradycardia, and have all sorts of problems. And they're very sensitive to shunt failures. On the other hand, it's happened quite frequently that a person's had a shunt for years. The shunt looks like it's working just great. As a matter of fact, for years, it's been draining too much. And that's causing uh, sagging and, and the uh, Chiari to be created. And what happened is, is that you don't need to do a Chiari decompression or redo Chiari decompression. You need to regulate the fluid shunt better. This, in this case, you can see afterwards, we took out the shunt from down below and, and the tonsils didn't come up to this level, but they came up enough uh, that both the symptoms of the Chiari disappeared and also the hydrocephalus uh, became much easier to regulate. So this is another example of pseudotumor. I won't go in detail, but the, the, the theme is the same. We didn't treat the Chiari directly, even though it's here, and they were symptomatic. We actually, in this case, opened up a vein, decreased the pressure of the fluid in the head, and everything relaxed. And there's uh, fluid that developed around the tonsils, and the syrinx that was there also decreased. So treating Chiari and syrinx without really doing a decompression, because we pay attention to the dynamic aspects of the fluid and in this case, the venous uh, obstruction. When you talk about dynamics, uh, it's, it's always a, a fascinating to see uh, what, what's really happening in the brain in a person with Chiari. This area is so tight that every time the fluid wants to go down, every time the heart beats and the fluid wants to go down past this junction, instead of it getting down, it pushes the brain down. And you can see this constant pushing downward with every heartbeat. This kind of pulsation downward does not occur in a normal situation. In a normal situation, fluid passes back and forth, but the brain does not push up and down like this. This is a, uh, 
a, a beautiful MRI done in a, in a in a kind of advanced technique from uh, uh, Bryn Martin, an engineer. Uh, that is also on our on our project, looking at deformation of the brain uh, with Chiari malformation. We could also look this at, at this in the operating room, and sometimes these tonsils. This is with ultrasound really do move and hit the spinal cord with every heartbeat. And sometimes you see them, they're not moving much at all, even though they're just as tight. And we're trying to understand uh, about this sort of dynamic. Here's another set where every heartbeat, the tonsils come down and push on the spinal cord. So how does this dynamic that's induced by fluid movement uh, affect Chiari malformation of the symptoms? Well, there's lots of ways CSF dynamics affect the progression uh, and perhaps symptom de development of Chiari. I'm not going to go over this diagram except to say CSF disorders affect at various levels. The dynamics, the crowding, CSF leaks, as I mentioned, can also cause a progression of crowding and so forth. And also you can see here other things that many of us talk about with Chiari malformation, from connective tissue disorders, trauma, uh, cervical instability, all these things can play in to the, the development of symptoms of people with Chiari. The key here is that the dynamic effect over time can create uh, more crowding and create more symptoms in some patients, and a lot of this is CSF disorders. So that's it. I hope that wasn't too long, but not everyone with Chiari, I should stress that not everyone with Chiari malformation, anatomical Chiari malformation, that is that descent of the tonsils when we, when we define it that simplistically, not everyone needs surgery. M most people who have that kind do not actually need surgery. And that crowding can occur, of course, from genetic changes and it's anatomical, but also it can evolve with dynamic factors of, of CSF movement and symptoms. Generally, it's still true that when things are tighter, then the patient is more likely to have symptoms, but uh, it's a general rule and this is, the relationship is not always very consistent, which means that when you decompress it, your results are not always so consistent. And and this is a part we, we won't get into, but even when you have a crowded fossa, what determines actually how much uh, pain and symptoms you're gonna have uh, and what those symptoms will be. One of the studies that we're, we're looking into is when you have crowding uh, in the, in the uh, cervical medullary junction, how does it affect higher regions of the brain? How does it affect things like emotional control and attention and so forth? And again, these things are just starting to be recognized, never mind understood. So with that, I'm going to uh, just give this back. If I can find a way to anti-share, stop sharing. I stop shared, and I just wanted to give you kind of that dynamic view and the view that CSF uh, affects Chiari, and then just kind of open up to any kinds of questions that you want. Perfect. Thank there you. Awesome. Um, that was a really good overview, and it actually touches on a couple of the questions that we had gotten in already. So I'm gonna try and whittle them down to some of the questions that maybe need a little bit more explanation or um, weren't touched on. So you kind of describe what cerebellar ectopia or tonsillar descent is, but uh, what imaging is really required to diagnose or show that for mm -hmm. uh, someone going into the clinic? Well, let, let's start with the, the sort of traditional uh, view of the tonsils, we, I showed many examples of kind of in the midline, that mid-sagittal. We also look at cross sections and we look at every angle really to, to describe of a standard MRI. Uh, we often, when we get an MRI, when we get a Chiari image, we get a high definition because it shows much better, not only the shape of the tonsils and what is seen at the, at the junction, but it can also sometimes show membranes. And sometimes it's as much other blockages of fluid which can cause symptoms as well. Uh, so we get a high definition. We also get what's called a semi flow. That shows, and I didn't show that here, I guess that would be typical to show with every heartbeat the fluid going up and down. And that, that is, is arguably, that gives some additional evidence that the, there's a fluid space and communication there. Uh, this is the kind of thing that we want to see to have normal, normal physiological function. So our standard Chiari. Uh, test is that it's also the entire spinal cord uh, because even though syrinxes can be most often in the cervical region, whenever we do a Chiari evaluation, we do it all the way down the spinal cord. So I touched upon other things like flexion extension. In these situations, uh, in the situations where a person has what looks in all ways as a Chiari type symptomatology, 
you, but you look at it and say, yeah, the tonsils are a little down, but it's not really that tight. Is it really causing the problem? Then uh, uh, it is very, very probably thorough to do a flexion extension to see if in certain anatomies we get a, a true compression. Uh, there are also people that, that make many measurements of flexion extension and the change of the angles because of this idea of hyperflexibility. I, I think the, the tie-in of the hyperflexibility and flexion extension films is that if you have a crowding back here, uh, you can imagine that any ability of the neck to, to flex more hyperflexibility can make it more vulnerable to, to compression if you're already tight there. So uh, you've got less elbow room and, and, you're, and you're, you're, you're bending more. So flexion extensions, I've occasionally done. I don't do it routinely in the first, in the first uh, uh, evaluation. Uh, and uh, finally, I mentioned uh, the, uh, the vertical ones. We don't use those routinely at all. We, the most single, most useful uh, measure has been for me, well, the single, I'd say the sagittal and the coronal views of the tonsils to get an idea, not only of the tonsil descent, but the compression of the whole area. Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of touch on it when you talk about flexion and extension, but about how often is tonsillar descent accompanied by other problems like craniocervical instability or tethered cord or CSF leak? Is that, what's the, how common is it? Yeah, to find? so I would say uh, that the majority of time, Chiari is not associated with an instability. The majority of time, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to give an exact number here because I don't think we really know. Uh, the majority of time, uh, it's not associated with any tethered cord uh, or hyper, hyper, hyper flexibility. These other factors, I think, increase your risk of having symptoms from Chiari. But, uh, but you can have the, the compression for all those reasons I mentioned, either an anatomically small posterior fossa, uh, fluid uh, issues and, and pressure changes. Uh, and not have a, either a, a tethered cord or hyperflexibility. So I think that these things can be considered uh, higher in frequency. Why are they higher in frequency? Because they increase your risk of having symptoms from here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, if if you can have tonsillar herniation and and not have much in the way of symptoms, uh, but if you add hyperflexibility, if you add some of these other elements, you you may have more symptoms and therefore may be discovered more and the rate of the association is up. That's very simplistic. There's, there's, there's people that are looking at the genetics to see if there's any genetic ties. Uh, and, and very likely there are. There's certainly ties between abnormal shaped uh, posterior skulls and necks and to uh, constriction or crowding there. So there, there are associations uh, genetically between tethered cords and spinal anomalies and posterior fossa anomalies. There's a spina bifida, which uh, of course is a disease of the whole uh, spinal cord and the, and the lower spine with the tethered cord and Chiari malformation. So there are of course associations, but I would say uh, that in general, uh, those never really, uh, I think take the majority, any one of them takes the majority of time, uh, percentage I should say. Great. So kind of getting to that though, what are the symptoms that something like this is, are gonna cause? And can those symptoms be positional? So like would they maybe get worse or better if you're lying down? So, I mean, classically, we talk about headache and neck pain and with Valsalva. Valsalva is when you bear down or when you cough or sometimes when, when people laugh, uh, they get a more severe headache. The idea is that anything that increases high pressure up here can push those tonsils, which are already tight, push them down even more. We've done intracranial pressure monitoring in patients who I'm concerned about uh, you know, do they have a Chiari that needs a decompression or do they have low pressures that are pulling the tonsils down? So we will get a, uh, an ICP monitoring. It's a pressure monitor that goes in the head. We have them walk around, sleep and so forth. And we make sure that they don't have high pressure that might be pushing the Chiari down or low pressures that are sucking it down. But my point about the symptoms is if they bend over or cough, we see high pressure spikes in the head. And those high pressure spikes are sometimes associated with those severe pains that people have uh, with the Chiari malformation. And that's kind of why those, those are characteristic because those increase, the things you do to increase the pressure in your head push back there specifically 
and give you and, and, and cause the symptoms. So that's one of the things that's very typical. The thing about Chiari is it's in a very busy area and it can affect, you know, it can affect swallowing and cranial nerves. It can affect the voice. It can affect even though the cranial nerve that affects the hearing and balance and so forth is a bit higher up, it can affect those things too. It can also cause compression of the spinal cord and the, uh, and the syrinx. So then now you have arm tingling and, and numbnesses. That, that, can, that can be very common as well. So when you say, you know, how does a Chiari present? That's a whole other big thing because it's a very busy area. In 80% of people, it's headaches uh, and, and headache and neck pain. It can be all over the head, but mostly in the back and often influenced by those things that increase pressure. Mm -hmm. Um, so you mentioned about voice. There was a really interesting question that came in before we joined, asking if it's possible that vocal tremors could be linked to Chiari or Swingomyelia, which I thought was an interesting well, question. You know, tremors in, in most all muscles, uh, <clears throat> including laryngeal muscles that control swallowing and the, and the voice. Uh, if you have weaknesses in your muscles or, or problems with the innervation, you, you can develop tremors. Uh, and and so you, you can have abnormalities of the movement of, of the vocal cords and weaknesses. Uh, sometimes weaknesses, like in children with cerebral palsy, result in actually spasms of the, of the muscles. And so you can have weaknesses and you can have spasms of muscles as well uh, due, due to, uh, due to a, anything that affects uh, the, the posterior fossa and, and the upper part of the brain. So I guess the answer is yes. Is it a... Is it a typical thing? No, no. Right. Uh, you know, there used to be a list on the internet of symptoms you can have with the Chiari malformation. I think there were about 147. And <laughs> any one of them, any one of us writing it out could probably check off at least five or six. Some people could check off 15 in, in, their, in, their, in their life. And it's because this is such a busy area. Uh, and so can I, can I think of a rationale why you might have spasms of the vocal cords or dysfunctional vocal cords? Sure, because the, 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 the systems that control uh, the vocal cords uh, are do uh, function through the posterior part of the brain. Right. Yeah, I think that's what makes this all so frustrating is that it could be pretty much anything that's affected by that brainstem area. Um, there was a really interesting question that came in the chat. Um, do you have any information on Chiari malformation and maybe post-concussive syndrome? And if those are causative in any, either direction? Yeah. That, that is, you know, that I think is interesting. Uh, and what we have, have seen, although I have to say, I don't know that it's been ever really demonstrated in the literature, but uh, we have felt that, that some like football players, people who, are, who, who have had concussions and who have prolonged recovery from them, some of them are quite tight. When you have a concussion, your, your whole brain can swell a little bit. Your, the pressure can go up transiently or even longer term. And, uh, and there can be a tightness. If you already have some tightness back there, you can imagine, and like all the other things I've been talking about, it can exacerbate it and, and cause the Chiari to be present. So I think that, that certainly head injury and concussion can be related to the, the making of a Chiari worse and, and also, uh, in a way, the, the syndrome of the concussion longer. Uh, but I think the, the, the head injury can cause a problem not only by generalized swelling and pressure in that area, but we don't know what, what an injury does to the head on the actual cervical medullary junction and this cerebellar tonsil and the, and the spinal cord to maybe cause some bruising and injury, maybe cause some inflammation, which also makes the, makes the symptoms worse. So I think the combination of being already tight back there and being vulnerable to, to, to concussions and having more symptoms, I think that that's real, although I have to say, uh, I don't know of the quantitation that's been done in the literature. Right. Um, there are really good questions coming in. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to start with this one because we were talking about it a little bit with the connective tissues. Um, how much is brain prolapse or hernia caused by weak fascia where the connective tissues holding the brain in place maybe just can't do their job properly? Most of the, most of the uh, fascia, like the dura itself, uh, is supported by tissue behind it, fat and other things, and bones right behind it. I would say fascia and so forth in the skull makes almost no difference because you've got the skull right there, all right? 
In other areas, you have uh, areas of like the lamina and the bones of the spine bridged by soft tissue, the dura, the coverings of the brain, and then fatty tissue and so forth. So there are situations in connective tissue disorders where, where that soft tissue, the dura, is not supported directly by the skull. You can have outpouches, right? Ec the, you know, ectopias. And, and these things uh, can look like just sacs of, of CSF fluid. And people with Marfan syndrome and, and, and other connective tissue disorders often have multiple ectasias. And uh, those can be a source of, of fluid leak. And I think that's usually the way they present uh, to us because as they get stretched and ballooned out, they get thinner and then they do cause CSF leaks. I'd say that one of the cause, one of the ways connective tissue disorders may inter, uh, may relate to Chiari is by more motion and flexibility in the cervical medulla, as many people have, uh, have uh, put forward. I think another way is that it makes the, uh, the fluid uh, pressure in the spinal canal much looser and even can cause leaks. And that can allow the tonsils more, uh, more ability to, to go down, uh, like you saw in those patients that had the low pressure. So connective tissue disorders do allow outpouchings. And moreover, uh, they can allow, because of those outpouching, leaks. And I think that those cause the problems too. Mm -hmm. um, so before we get away from the symptoms and stuff. Uh, you mentioned cognition and different studies that are being done there. And two questions came in prior. So are you aware of any studies being conducted or, or new studies being planned even in the surgical or the neuropsychological community that might measure Chiari's impact on patients' cognitive functioning over time? So I guess over the lifespan, If I, obviously that's going to take a while to get, but is there anything being done in that area? And as a follow-up, is there anything that's studying associations maybe with like ADHD or executive functioning, autism, different things, and how that might be impacted on the cerebellum? Oh my gosh, those are two, two <laughs> great big questions. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll go to the, the things like attention deficit and uh, afterwards. The first one was, what was the first one? So basically, uh, what studies are being done in cognitive yeah, functioning? And, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, there is a group, and this is there's actually a, a group in Ohio that that uh, that has studied uh, different ages and longitudinal, but they do are they're doing it in a cross-sectional way in patients who have had Chiari develop at, at different ages and followed them at different different uh, periods in time. And it's a very difficult study because you're, you're looking at very different people with different Chiari malformations, uh, decompressed to different extents. But they're one of the only groups I saw that, that looked at you know, uh, younger, older uh, patients and looked at uh, deficits and disorders. Uh, so I have to say that there's not much known about how it evolves in any particular population as they grow, for the reasons kind of you said, that's a long-term study. That's more than a, a five-year grant. That's like a 50-year grant. So we don't know that much because all there's been is a few cross-sectional studies of people at different ages, and they're very different. Um, I think that the question really asks the question, does Chiari malformation affect the entire brain over a long period of time? And I think that's a fascinating question. It kind of leads to the second, uh, the second part of, 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 the, uh, of the question is, I used to think, of, of Chiari affecting back here, and it does. Uh, but all those fibers, of course, are, are projecting up to the thalamus, the centers of the brain, and then to the cortex. In other words, it's communication up and down. So we have to ask the question, if you're squeezing something down here, how does it affect fibers going up and down? And what sort of circuits might it involve? Uh, we've learned a lot about the brain in general. We used to think the back of the brain and the cerebellum controlled movements and coordinated your golf swing. Uh, and uh, no, no reference to golf here, but, <laughs> but uh, it does so much more than that. We now know that it coordinates and, and probably coordinates even verbal kinds of coordinations. And it, it and also may help us control our, uh, not only our movements, but subtleties of our emotions and feelings. These are all kind of new concepts for the cerebellum, but it really is real. We, we can't classify the cerebellum back here as just affecting our movement. It affects so many of these other things. One interesting aspect of this 
is the middle part of the cerebellum on the bottom has areas that are part of what's called the default network. So what's the default network? If you do a functional MRI, oh, so if we do an MRI, there's a type of MRI which can explore parts of your brain that are active because it looks at when more blood goes to them, the more, more oxygenated blood. So it looks at for the patterns of where your brain is active. And once it can define what parts of your brain are active, it then through lots of you know, computer analysis can decide which, which parts of the brain come active together and which ones form like this whole group in different areas of the brain are networked together and work together. Well, these are called networks and there's a parts of your brain, of course, that activate when you read something or when you are afraid of something or when you're playing golf. And so there's different areas of the brain which, which are activated, but there's also, and this I think is, is fascinating because of the cerebellum and Chiari, there's parts of the brain which are specifically activated when you're not doing anything. And it's called the default network. Or and it's like it's if you if you're driving your car, steering and accelerating, that's lots of parts of your car are, are, are being used. Then you go to a red light and you're idling. Okay, and nothing's going on. You're not steering, you're not braking anything, you're not changing anything, you're listening to the music, but the car is just purring very softly. So this asks the question: what parts of your brain are active when you're idling? Well, it turns out that some of those areas are back here in the cerebellum. And it turns out that many disorders that the psychologists and the psychi psychiatrists look at, including emotional control, attention control, are related to your ability to idle and then to activate. And so if you have a system which is, which is affecting uh, your idle system and your ability to, to pull back and then attend to something, uh, then it can have a lot of effects. And it's been looked at, this, this network, for, with attention deficit disorder <clears throat> and with OCD. It's kind of different, different holes of the, uh, of the system. And it's also uh, been looked at for emotional control. Now, I have to say that this is all quite speculative. I'm, what's not speculative is we now know the cerebellum does a lot more. And what uh, exactly how this default network really works and engages and how it gets disturbed in Chiari is not known clearly. But we at least know now that there are mechanisms, even in the cerebellum, which can affect in very kind of interesting and subtle ways the, the, the functioning, even emotional functioning of the, entire, of the entire brain. And I don't want to overplay that because we don't know much about it, but that is, an, that is a... Uh, important aspect of what, what people are also uh, looking into now. And they're looking at the deficits in attention in people with Chiari of all different ages. Right. Yeah, that's really interesting, actually. I didn't know about that. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to think of how to say this. So what are some common issues that actually I'll a question just came up in the chat and it's related to this, so I'll do that first. Is there a study happening as far as deficits in attention? I know you kind of alluded to that. I just, where's, where are those studies being done? Well, actually, uh, there are a number and I can't, I, I don't, I'd be remiss if I missed some that, that uh, in other locations, but there are, there are some studies that are being done uh, uh, at University of Akron and at Concord Chiari that they are looking at attention deficits. Uh, they're using, and I, I was a part of some of these studies where we were using uh, electrophysiological measurements, EEG, uh, and, uh, and also just neuropsych batteries and looking at attention deficits. So yes, there are mm -hmm. studies being done and uh, actually we're, we're expanding them. Yeah, uh, another really good one. So you talk about the cerebellum having issues with like the idling system. Might this explain some problems with insomnia or getting to sleep? Maybe. Well, I, yeah, you know, it, it could, when you think about this whole system, it could, it could affect almost everything. So I, I, I can't say no, but I, I can't say that there's been, I don't know of any studies that specifically looked at sleep dysfunction with idling. Doesn't mean they're not out there. Uh, the default network is not my major area. I'm, I'm just a surgeon, you know, I'm just a guy with a scalpel. But, <laughs> but, I, uh, but it's certainly, if it affects these areas of idling and activation, that it'd be a plausible area of, of research. Yeah. Um, so just before we step away from symptoms specifically, because I know there are a lot of questions in the chat about um, surgeries and 
their failures. But <laughs> um, first, I just wanted to ask, so you mentioned that every time the heart beats, there's some pulsations. So can those pulsations cause like long-term damage to the brainstem or to the point where maybe a surgery wouldn't, and I guess it gets to the point of surgical failure, um, would those symptoms necessarily get better? Or maybe if there's damage, um, what would you say? So th this really gets to the heart of one of the reasons that people are studying it is some may just say, oh, this, we're talking about a few millimeters back and forth, and we're talking about the spinal cord just moving a little bit. It's probably nothing, except it happens you know, 60, 60 times per, per minute, and it happens millions of times in, in your life, and could it develop some, some gliosis or problems in itself? The second reason people are looking at this constant back and forth is because its effects are perhaps on the elasticity of the brain and the ability if, if, you, if you push something that's plastic and keep pushing it, over time, you'll, you'll get farther. In other words, if you keep, keep doing this constantly, will those tonsils go down further? So is it involved in the progression? And that, that's not certain. Uh, and are these, changes, are these changes in elasticity and deformability permanent or are they temporary? I'd have to clearly say we don't know because we're just looking at them. But but certainly it's possible that these are just functional problems with fluid pressure that once you open up the fluid space and once the, the tonsil stops doing all that, that the progression stops and maybe some of the some symptoms stop. We know that the symptoms can occur in the brain with, with changes in pressure with, with your heartbeat. I mean, aside from Chiari. So it's certainly plausible that some of these symptoms are not due to damage that's irreversible here but due to the actual pressure changes and the fluctuations themselves. And that would be great because uh, Chiari decompression, which opens up those CSF spaces, has the potential to equalize the pressure and get rid of that kind of motion and fluctua fluctuation. And so it might, might play a role directly in the symptom relief. Mm -hmm. So to kind of get to, we have a couple of miscellaneous questions, but I want to get to surgery since that's kind of like bread and butter. <laughs> um, what are the options, I guess, surgical and non-surgical though, that might help improve CSF flow or at least symptoms? Um, so I know one thing that happens often is you don't necessarily see more space, but the patient gets better. But what are those options surgically or non-surgically for patients? Yeah. So it, it would be a very interesting question to know if, if there were, and there are manipulations which affect the amount of pulsatility. As a matter of fact, people often ask, why is it when I run and you know you, you get your cardiac output out, so why do I have more, more symptoms in a lot of situations where the pressure, things are tight in the head. Uh, and so control of pulsatility, not going running or, or medications that do that or control the, the, uh, the, the heart uh, can affect uh, symptoms from this area in Chiari. Uh, it's probably not a very effective way, and uh, it's probably not something you, you want to do generally, but, but certainly uh, those things can have an effect, pro and con, as can, again, running and, and the, those sorts of things. Uh, there is, there is as, as I mentioned, changes that we make not of the bony area here at all. There's a lot of things that we do that are, and some of them aren't surgical. For example, one patient we had they got a stent. Well, that's it's a procedure. They opened up the vein here, relieved the pressure in the head, and actually, I don't know if we, we you probably didn't see it in that picture, but the, the fluids, the Chiari was whole, filling up the whole space in the junction, and after that stent was put in, it went up just to show a little sliver of fluid, a tiny sliver, and that was enough to cause a, a treatment not only of the Chiari symptoms, but to reduce the syrinx. So sometimes it takes an almost perceptibly little difference in, in what may, you may see in the tonsil descent or the fluid spaces, but there may be fluid spaces on the side or in the front, which open up enough to transmit enough pressure. And so manipulations far away from that junction, which affect the fluid pressures, can affect it. Uh, uh, for example, we have situations where a person comes to us consulting, they have Chiari, they had a Chiari decompression. Oh, this was a, and, and she wanted to know if she can get pregnant. She still has headaches when she's up and so forth. Well, I looked at the, we did redid an MRI. She had carried decompression years ago. And oh my God, 
her cerebellum was so sunken down. I was, I came and saying, you know, I'm, I'm surprised <laughs> you're, you're just asking about, you know, uh, about about your activities. And she confessed that her Chiari decompression never really helped her much. And things have gotten you know, maybe a little bit even worse over time. And I'm looking, of course, how things have sunken down. Well, she didn't need a redo Chiari at all. Uh, she didn't need a recompression because it would have just made things sink down. What we did is find a leak in her back. And with a needle, I didn't do this, this is the uh, interventional radiologist, with a needle put in a patch which sealed a hole uh, where there was a leak in CSF, and that caused enough pressure in the bottom to raise things up enough and alleviate her symptoms. Wow. And so, yeah, I mean, it's a procedure, but it's not surgery. And again, it's, look, it's treating the dynamics of the situation uh, and not just the, uh, the bony decompression. I will say that my... My respect for the flexibility of the brain and, and the up and down uh, motion of the brain, both just the oscillations, but also just generally, uh, has grown so much over the years. I, I, I can tell you I've done a bony decompression, and boy, that looks great. And it, <laughs> it's, there's space, and I'm really happy with it. But if there's a leak or something down below and that's happened, uh, all of a sudden, it looks like you weren't even there. All of a sudden, things are crowded again. The tonsils are even swollen a little bit. They fill up the whole space. You say, well, if this was such a matter of the bony decompression here, why is it that a, a fluid dynamic thing makes it look like you weren't, almost weren't even there and you need to do a redo now? And uh, it tells us that, of course, the compression there is a real thing and tightness there is a real thing that causes symptoms. But the bone itself, the skull itself, is not, you, not always the culprit. It's not a deformation of the bone. It's the dynamic and movement of the brain, which is the culprit, and which you always have to, to keep in mind before you do a Chiari decompression as well. Yeah. So I guess we'll get into like some failure questions. I guess unsuccessful decompressions, we'll call them, um, because it kind of touches on that. So you, there's a question. If a patient has a Chiari decompression and it's considered unsuccessful, when would a second decompression be considered? So I guess sort of to that how do you test for something like a csf leak how do you know it's going to even be there how do you know it's that versus another decompression well if we start before the decompression was ever done uh any person that comes in you're asking the question is this is this chiari one that is probably only due to this bony mal you know malformation or, or tightness or small posterior faucet some people measure the posterior faucet and say you know yours is very small and I think yours needs to be enlarged. There's sometimes I look at a Chiari and I see that the, the back looks actually quite normal and large. So it, it isn't necessarily that. And we look for other signs of, on imaging or of symptoms that might indicate that it's this fluid dynamic problem. Is there, of course, is there a hydrocephalus like I showed, you know? But also, is there brain sagging? Is there a large amount of fluid above the skull? It means the brain sagging a little bit. That could be the lower pressure, okay? Mm -hmm ironically, the pituitary gland swells up and gets bigger. Uh, and veins, certain veins get bigger. In other words, when you pull fluid out of the brain, more venous blood and pituitary blood engorges. The meninges get thicker. So if I see a patient with thickened coverings of the brain that enhance big pituitary, a little bit of sag in the brain, these are all subtle signs, especially when you put them together, that this person doesn't have a Chiari problem they have a problem with low pressure. And you look for those same sort of signs in a person who's had a Chiari uh, decompression. Does it look like, uh, especially if you can get films right after they did it, does it look okay when they did it, but over time it just sagged down into that place? That's that cerebellar ptosis. And that cerebellar ptosis is likely due most of these fluid dynamic uh, forces that we're talking about. The, the cerebellum gets get basically pulled down, not because it's a rock in a pond. It's not really that much heavier than the water, but because uh, of the pressure differential that's developed by low pressure here or high pressure above. So you, you look for things that, that, that indicate that there's generally low pressure. Symptomatology also can point in that direction. Uh, a strong aspect of positional headaches. You get up and uh, you, you have a problem. Uh, you lay down, you feel better. That's a general sign of, of low pressure. And, you know, again, markings on the MRI. And if it comes down to it, in several cases where I'm not sure, there's a few 
suspicions, I put that ICP monitor in the head, like I discussed before, and I look for high or low pressures. If the pressure is entirely normal and not involved, then I think it's back there and I do a TRE. Okay. Um, there's a couple of people interested in this question. So there's discussion about a report that up to a third of Chiari decompressions eventually fail because of a co-occurring connective tissue disorder, either being missed or ignored, and then subsequent um, craniocervical instability starts to develop because of some additional mobility caused by removing some of that bone there when you do the Chiari decompression. Um, is there anything that you can speak to about that? How is it up to a third or? Um, well, no, I, I, I can't really speak to the proportion. I'd have to look at their data, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and uh, not having the paper and the data before me, that seems like a bit high number, but I'm not going to dispute it because I don't see their data. Uh, as I said, I don't think it's the majority of time that there's connective tissue disorders primarily involved. Uh, it does speak to the issue of how much we do destabilize uh, when we do an operation back there. Uh, and ideally, we're not involving the joints, but even when you involve the muscles back there, you are, of course, disturbing the, 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 the structure and, and the stability to some extent. Uh, I, to my knowledge, have not had, when you do purposely limited Chiari decompressions that don't affect the joints and so forth, the instance of, of, a, of, a, of a major instability or one that requires fusion that you cause, I think is actually quite low, much lower than 30%. But I agree with the, the, the proposition that increased flexibility uh, can be part of failure, for sure. Uh, and if a person has increased flexibility, I think they're more vulnerable to, uh, to compressions and abnormalities here, and your simple de-roofing and decompression may not be enough. Uh, so I think that, that that's one of the reasons you know, that Chiaris may fail. Uh, one of the earlier reasons people talked about again was the tethered cord. Maybe they have a tethered cord and there was an error where people were getting tethered cord releases. And I don't think that that really uh, is supported by research experimental or really clinically. So people have gone a lot of directions. Uh, there was a period of time where they said a little decompression is enough. You have small posterior faucet, you have to take off the whole back end and put a new one on that's bigger. That's a pretty big operation, and there's logic behind it. Uh, and it all is the question, it all arose because of failure of the basic decompression to work. Well, it doesn't work because we didn't do enough, or it doesn't work because the cord's being pulled down, or it doesn't work because there's still too much flexibility. And I, I do, I think that flexibility adds something, but uh, I'm not sure how often it really uh, it causes the real failure. Right. Is there any way to know, I guess, before, assuming this patient had never had surgery before, is there any way to know that that person might be more prone to some instability before you go in? Or is that like genetic testing? How do they do that? Well, yeah, there, there, there is both genetic testing and, of course, basic uh, flexibility tests that most all of us do. <laughs> and I have to say, everyone says, look, I do this. I, I have a, I have a, you know, a tissue disorder, connective tissue disorder. Then I usually say that well, I could do this too, and and there's of course a rating scale, uh, and it, there's uh, the idea that many people have more flexibility than others, and some might get to a range, <clears throat> which is uh, which is problematic. I, I, it's probably not a coincidence that a lot of a lot of people have the flexibility are the ones that are the gymnasts and so forth. Maybe they had a, a propensity for that uh, in the first place, but uh, I, you know. I think assessing a person's uh, by history and also by the flexibility test, which I won't get into and demonstrate all the, the uh, tests they, they <laughs> use for flexibility, but uh, they, they can help you do that. I'm not sure if they would ever change, unless you saw kinds of really abnormal angles that might cause uh, abnormal angles of the spinal cord itself or, or that you see is causing or adding to a compression. I'm not sure that uh, having a connective tissue disorder would stop a person from getting a Chiari operation if they felt that there was a primary compression there in the first place. Mm -hmm. And if after that initial decompression, what would be the symptoms specifically to 
indicate that maybe that patient has like an issue with too, like too much mobility at the back of the head there? Well, I mean, one of the things that we do is we, we have them move their head and see if that makes it more symptomatic. Another key test uh, that we've used several times, I think other people may use it more, is to have people in collars and immobilize their head for a period of time uh, and see if that reduces symptoms. So it's, a, it's in a sense a trial and error, it's an empiric test to see if motion has that kind of effect. Of course, there are, there are uh, angles and things that, that are measured to see if they're hyperreflexic as well. And there's some dispute as to how much is abnormal. Uh, some people are strict about the angles and some, some are not. But the point is, if, if they are uh, having wide variations with flexion extension, and especially if it affects their symptoms, then it's certainly legitimate to consider uh, aspects of fusion. You know, I, I, I've, I've had several patients I've put in college for periods of time to see if the, any motion effects are involved with their symptoms. Yeah, yeah, that's a good um, differential way to do that. Um, there's a really interesting question, and it's kind of long, so I'm going to just get into it. <laughs> so someone's son had had hydrocephalus, and her original shunt was placed 30 years ago with no revisions. Then they wound up, for some reason, having four decompressions. And then after the fourth one, uh, oh, I'm sorry, they, it was for syringobulbia to improve a severe sleep apnea. Um, I don't know what AHI stands for, but AHI numbers decreased to below five for eight days after surgery. Um, but the numbers have increased, increased again, ranging from like 15 to 20. Um, have you ever had any patients presenting with similar issues? And I guess in May of 2019, they were decompressed, but surgery was unable to be completed due to tethering of the brainstem actually on a vertebral artery. Um, so that's a lot, but <laughs> I'll let you speak so, to it. So it certainly is a scary thing when the syrinx from the spinal cord heads up towards the brain stem itself and into the brain. Actually, I have a patient in-house right now uh, with that kind of problem. Uh, and, and a beautiful uh, decompression already. And so you, you, you wonder uh, why, and they have a syrinx, obviously, but it, and it's gone up. And... Uh, I, again, think in this situation, it is often a matter of, of, of flow uh, at the cervical medial junction. This person has, uh, has sagging downward and has a blockage of the outflow of the fourth, which can push fluid down into the syrinx and push fluid up into the medulla. I hadn't thought of it originally, but this person also, and I, I'm, there are a few people, this is like an archetype because I've had a few of these, that, oh, maybe we should do another key area decompression because I did it and it thought it was good, but now I look at it, it still looks tight. And so you do another one. And you can see it's the same pattern I was talking about. You, you're doing the Chiari, you're getting rid of the bony compression, but yet the brain is, is still sagging and, 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 and falling. It's a, it's a hydrodynamic problem. It turns out that currently, and also patients from the past, they've had shunts for 30 years that, those shunts are very likely not running properly. And I, one time I remembered an old pediatric adage that if a person has a shunt, no matter what they're going on, you think it's scary, check the shunt. And, if, and I, was, I didn't know what to do with this patient because it was, a, it was gonna be a second redo that came in as a consult. And I could say, yeah, things look a little tight there. But then I remembered, check the shunt. This patient had a shunt since they were age one. Now, I didn't think the patient had high had a shunt problem at all because the ventricles were small, so there's probably not a problem. But I did an ICP measurement, and sure enough, there was no high pressure. The shunt was working. However, it was working so much that when they stood up, the pressure went down to minus 15. This person had chronic overdrainage, and no one suspected the shunt because the ventricles looked okay. They were not getting enlarged. There was no shunt dysfunction. But in fact, those old valves over time can just not drain enough, not be regulated enough and drain too much. And in her, we put a regulatory device, which stopped the overdrain and gradually over time, her symptoms got, got better. They never actually completely resolved it. They got a lot better, much better than if we did another Chiari decompression. So you have to look at the root cause of, of compression back here, which can sometimes be, again, even a shunt from above that was put in 30 years ago. Wow, that's 
terrifying. <laughs> but good to know that at least that's a good place to start if that's your anatomy. If a person um, has it done for a long period of time, you always have to look at it. If it's failing, it could be pushing. And if it's succeeding too much, draining too yeah. much, it could be causing <laughs> a problem as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, for I had a question that came in, and we're going to get kind of into miscellaneous now, but what is the terminology? Obviously, it just continues to be a problem in Chiari and CSF disorders. So, uh, what's the correct name for pooling of the C of CSF in the brain accompanied by an empty cella? So, this person suggests: Is it idiopathic intracranial hypertension, hydrocephalus, pseudotumor cerebri, or something else? Okay, so the pituitary is an amazing thing because it's really kind of it's it's not really in the brain; it's like right next to the brain and it's highly vascular. And it becomes, it's like a sponge. If the pressure in the head's low, it expands. And remember I mentioned that's one of the signs of low pressure. And if the pressure's high in the brain, it shrinks down like a sponge you're squeezing, okay? So if you have a partially empty, this is another thing where it's just not an anatomical thing as much as a dynamic thing. If you have an empty cella, it usually means that you have had or have higher pressures in the head, which have squeezed down over time uh, the pituitary gland. So the, the em partially empty cella is because the cella holds the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland is shrunk down to the bottom because the pressure above in the brain has done that to it, okay? It's a sign that there has been, it's like the footprint of high pressure. That high pressure uh, can be a, a hydrocephalus or it can be a pseudotumor. Very frequently it's considered a, a sign of a pseudotumor. Why it's considered a sign of pseudotumor? Because in pseudotumor, the, everything else looks normal, but you have that little telltale smashing of the pituitary gland. In hydrocephalus, everything looks abnormal, so you don't need the, any other hints. So people often say, ah, look at that, normal brain, but with an empty cella, that must be pseudotumor or intracranial hypertension. What's, what's kind of neat about that is, uh, you know, it doesn't always re-expand completely, but you can get little changes in size and people look into, can we use that as a barometer? Because the you know goes up and down, but not it's not good enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So another question. This is getting away from surgery necessarily, but this patient reports like some nerve pain, um, and this is really more learning about what's being done. So are there any studies that are being done or medications and trials? for nerve pain that you might feel hopeful about. Um, they, they say, please feel free to stress that I'm not asking for me medication recommendations. I stopped taking them decades ago, but this patient is hopeful that maybe one day there will be something for nerve pain. And I actually don't know the answer to this, and I'm actually really interested to see if you have any. <laughs> you know, uh, we have a lot of people for various reasons, uh, most of them quite frankly outside of Chiari, that, that uh, have, have various forms of nerve pain. Uh, there's one medication which is the staple that everybody uses, and uh, you know other things are quite experimental in terms of various forms of anti-inflammatory and so forth. The 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 one that everyone uses is neurontin gabapentin, uh, and uh, it's fairly successful, and some people don't tolerate it very well. And part of the problem is nerve pain can be a cycle of pain that involves not just the nerve but centers of, of, of pain that the, the, the irregular circuitry or irregular input from the nerve causes abnormalities in, the, in, in even deeper areas. So you can solve it on the outside, but you end up with central pain as well. And so sometimes uh, just treating the quote nerve pain isn't, isn't enough anymore with chronic pain. Pain is a very, very, uh, it's a very complicated area. Uh, and uh, things that would reduce inflammation, gabapentin, which slows down conduction of you know, electrical activity and so forth, uh, can, be, can be used and is somewhat successful. I don't uh, offhand know of anything spiritually, nothing specific for Chiari. And uh, I would have to say that there probably are lots of people that are trying other things that are more effective than gabapentin, but there's nothing uh, that uh, really that's on the market right now that, that is used as, as, as much as gabapentin or neurotin. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you can speak to this necessarily, but complex regional pain syndrome and uh, stuff like that, where basically 
um, pain just starts to get like kind of send into overdrive and it's almost like a baseline. Um, what's being done, is there anything that can be done A, surgically for something like that? Or is it again, just something that you're prescribing things like gabapentin and hoping that they work? As far as I know, so far it's just that, but that those are areas that are, you know, I think it really experimental level. And I, I wouldn't know enough about the about ways of treating that at this point to comment. Okay. <laughs> um, so there's a question in the chat, and I I've, I've been trying to look it up while we were talking, but I I can't find it. There's a recent report from Dr. Raymond Demadian about uh, cranial cervical, um, the cranial cervical junction and how it might lead to varying levels of like brain dysfunction and i'm going to admit that i haven't read it so i i can't elaborate any more on that but i don't know if you have any if you've read the the report or any of his papers or if you have anything to say about so are you talking the about how compression the compression here can affect various areas of the brain right brain. Right, right right if you can maybe describe that and um i guess well i think that's a very very interesting topic and, and uh because again, you know, the, the entire bottom of the brain stem and spinal cord can be can be compressed or compromised. People have done what's called DTI or, or, or fiber track studies to see what areas of the brain uh, are projected to. And it turns out that areas of the brain uh, in the major relay nuclei, the, the thalamus that go out to the cortex, and also areas that are affected in our, what well, what's classically called the emotional circuits. Uh, the, it's the uh, hippocampus, other areas that affect even things like memory and control of emotion, the fibers that are vulnerable for compression in Chiari are fibers that go all the way up to these central areas uh, and up to the frontal areas and up to the, to the areas like the, the basal ganglia and so forth, and, and the thalamus. And so uh, we we found that in some of our trade trade you know tracking papers, as have others, and there is through those fiber connections alone certainly ways that that higher cognitive functions can be affected uh, you know the, but the brain is the brain is pretty resilient and uh, has, is pretty what we call robust so th the way the degree to which they are altered and the degree to which the brain is disrupted by them i think is is not understood or, or can be quite variable and of course i would say that of course people who are pinched back here have fibers which are affected to those areas how much it really is responsible for symptoms and personality, we just don't know yet. Because again, there's a lot of there's a lot of fibers and there's a lot of robustness in all the circuitry that might compensate. And we found, right. for example, with the neuropsychological studies and the, and the and the tracking studies, that certain areas will compensate and actually be better because certain areas have deficits. So how that really boils down to affecting systems and symptoms uh, is is another matter. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've yeah. answered your question or not. I don't know well, the particular study you're looking at, but, but right, uh, yeah. <laughs> I know the fiber tracking studies. Yeah, no, and I I think one of the frustratingly running themes of today's talk is just how little we actually know so far. Um, a lot of this work is ongoing and I, it's just so early days that we can't really necessarily say much about it. Um, Although there's been a lot of new thinking, I mean, new frontiers that are opening, and the, the close-mindedness of just thinking that this does one thing and squeezing and to de decompress it uh, is really what's uh, we we moved on from. So it's a, it's a it's a good era too. Right. That's that was very positive. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So there's two to three more questions then. Um, this one's interesting. Has anyone ever done an MRI, an axial MRI or cine MRI in a patient with a suspected tethered cord? And I don't know the answer to that. A axial or cine in the spinal cord? Because yes. we, yes. Oh yeah. Uh, I, we used to actually push our radiologists to, to get a cine flow spinal cord motion. Uh, and it, it was uncertain as to exactly because we didn't 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 know much about the norms, but there was some, and there's some. I think there's some published work out there as well. And that when a spinal cord is is, is obviously tethered and tight, it will move less. Uh, you know, it will move up and down less certainly, and it may seat differently in the canal, and it would in a sense bounce bounce more or less. 
Uh, and also we looked at movement, uh, spinal cord up and down. Uh, because if, 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 if it's loose, it probably will not, it, there's a certain amount of, if it's very tight, it might not move. And if it's very loose, it might not move with, with, with you're looking at how it moves with the heartbeat basically. Mm -hmm. And so a certain amounts of tightness, it will actually move more or less. And uh, we used to look for restrictions in motion in the spinal cord due to tethering. So that's been done uh, in the, in the uh, rostral caudal direction in terms of movement up and down. And we've also looked at it, other people have looked at it uh, in the movement uh, anterior and posterior as well. Basically movements with, with, with the heartbeat, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the, the ultimate value of those is, is uh, I'm sorry to keep saying things like this, no. <laughs> but it, it's not known because the norms of what is normal and, and so forth are not that clear. Mm -hmm. Um, this one's interesting and it gets to what we were just talking about. Um, if you could have any research project done now that you would understand something about this, what would that thing be? I guess open-ended. <laughs> I think the, the understanding, the process that we, that actually we talked about, about going from a, a congested and compressed area back here to its branching off effects on the rest of the brain and, and how it, it creates the variety of symptoms is, a, is such, uh, it's, it's, it's something we really need to know much better to understand uh, the symptoms that occur with Chiari, the variety, and what we can improve and what we can't. Uh, and is decompression of a certain area, uh, is it reversible, is it not, is, is, is communication of fluid enough and so forth. So understanding the relationship between compression and damage here and the rest of the brain is something I think uh, is, is key for us to understand. Uh, lots of people are trying, we're trying to look at how the brain is deformed with Chiari and how it changes after we've decompressed it. Uh, I've sometimes have been happy with the decompression and then the cerebellar tonsils, which were wedge-shaped, blossom out and get bigger, you know? Yeah. The deformation disappears. <laughs> Another thing that I think is, is really interesting is, is the symptoms that occur. Uh, why is it that, and this is something everybody's looking at, why is it that some anatomy looks just the same and symptoms are occurring now? Is there something like inflammation uh, that, that is uh, uh, causing this, something far and away different from compression that we're just missing? Uh, and again, the other upper functions like emotional control and so forth, I would love to know about those. But all those things, I think we have to start here because right. the problem, I mean, as a, as a neurosurgeon, I really think the problem is back here and it is compression. But we have to be careful about what's causing the compression, uh, if it's fluid dynamics or cranium or whatever. And even though it begins here with compression, to understand how the symptoms evolve and how they affect the rest of the brain, that's the, that's the I think, most interesting and ultimately clinically important question. Yeah. I mean, well, that, the pathophysiology or how that disease process happens, I mean, that's what you'd have to treat anyway. So it's exactly. Yeah, we, we, we can't treat it well. We can do pretty well just in most cases decompressing really tight things. It right. makes, it makes <laughs> sense. But to do it better and to do it more consistently and not to make some people worse, we have to understand the physiology much better. Yeah, I second that. So <laughs> you're, you're on. but. <laughs> um, so there are two questions that, or two people ask this, but it's the same question. So how can people get in touch with you specifically? So I know uh, um, if someone were to reach out to Johns Hopkins, how could they know that they would be able to see you? Um, because everyone loves you so much. and <laughs> They would like to see you. <laughs> well, uh, you just have to, you call Hopkins and you request my office. Okay. It's, it's, really, it's really that simple. Right. And I, I see mostly adults. I am I am certified in pediatrics. I still do pediatrics. However, the really small kids, infants, I let the pediatric team uh, uh, do that. But I, I see young. I'm, I'm I'm treating ten to ten year olds and twelve year olds as well. But I have a mostly uh, adult and young adult practice, and I'd be okay. happy to see anybody. Yeah, and then I guess to this, I've been kind of ending all of these with this question since we're in such weird times with COVID and everything. Um, are you seeing patients from out of state? Uh, do you do remote um, second opinions, anything like that? 
I have to say, like all of you, I've grown accustomed to these little squares. And I think telemedicine is one of the best things to come out of a tragic situation. Uh, we do. And right now, with the COVID uh, situation so active, uh, it has been quite liberal. There's a large number of states that we can, we can telemedicine with. I can also telemedicine with anybody that I've started with at follow-ups. But I can do new telemedicine visits with a number of states. There's actually a, a list of maybe 15 to 20 that is allowed. There's other that, that's allowed in certain situations. Uh, but uh, yes, I do telemedicine visits. I think it's a great way from a person from a distance to, to get evaluated if, if it's permitted. The question is, and it really is an open question, I actually asked the dean of our, of our school this two weeks ago. When the COVID, in a sense, passes, as it will, uh, what is going to happen to the telemedicine issue? And we are trying very much to maintain a large part of telemedicine ability because it's wonderful. I'm, I feel like an old time doctor. I'm going, I'm making house calls. Yeah. <laughs> kind of neat. I can see the paintings on their walls and they get <laughs> to, to describe a lot of, get a lot of information, not physical exam. And that's still important, but we can get a lot of information which says, you know, Hey, it would be worthwhile you even coming here or not. Yeah. And many times it's not, but it's still good information for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that would be great. So again, if someone wanted to see you either in telemedicine or in person, they, they're going to call your office and ask for your schedule specifically, or how does it work? I'm sorry, no, I forgot. They just call my <laughs> office and, and they can self-refer. They just call my office and ask for an appointment, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's also uh, on the internet, uh, I think, uh, on the operators list, also the Chiari Center. The Chiari Center has, as I listed right at the beginning of my talk about four neurosurgeons that do a lot of Chiari, we all, we all do a lot of Chiari. Uh, and so, and I, I recommend them all, uh, uh, but uh, if you ask, if you say Chiari, you say specifically for me, it'll just come to me. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you, Dr. Luciano, that was awesome. <laughs>